Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Sports Central. I'm Neil Duncan. We have got a fantastic show lined up. We're going to talk college football, uh, college softball. We're even going to talk a little golf. So stick around for this week's edition of Sports Central. Everybody. Welcome back to Sports Central. I'm Neil Duncan alongside Devin Cook. And uh, first time on Sports Central? Yeah, see how it goes. We're breaking him in. <laughs> We're certainly breaking him in. Well, you'll do fine. This first segment brought to us by Hall Communications. Of course, uh, the big four there in Lakeland. Uh, you can catch the radio version of Sports Central on 96.7 and Talk 1430 WLKF every Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. So uh, we certainly appreciate them. Of course, they call it the mothership, 97.5 WPCV, the country station that goes coast to coast. and. Uh, great partners that help promote events going on in Polk County. Do a lot of big things. Well, our first segment we're excited for. Uh, if you're a Bartow Yellow Jacket fan, you might not be as excited uh, as maybe uh, the Polk State uh, fans, but uh, we're going to welcome to uh, our first segment here uh, Donna Byers, the new Polk State College head softball coach. And Donna, congratulations on the new position. Thank you. Appreciate it. Of course, uh, played softball at Bartow High School under Glenn Rutenbar and then uh, came back when he stepped aside and retired from uh, being the head coach at Bartow High School. And uh, things didn't fall off, did they? You, got, you, you did a great job. Don't be humble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you can kind of say I rode some to coattails, excuse me, but I got beginner's luck is what I call it. Um, I got pretty lucky with three district titles and state championship in there, so... Yeah. Well, I think you can call it luck if you win one district title, but you won three in a row all three years. And, uh, of course, the state championship and actually went to two state finals, if I'm correct. Yes, sir. Yes. And of course, I'm a Bartow guy, so I know I'm correct right? on that. <laughs> you, you are correct. Yeah, the first year was the final four, and then um, the second year was the state, state title. So, yeah. So talk to us a little bit, what, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Polk State in, in a second, but uh, was Bartow your first head coaching position? I started off at Lake Gibson. Um, that was actually my first year. Um, okay. And then once the coach Rootmar said he was retiring, I applied for the job at Bartow. So. Okay. And then, uh, of course, uh, the three, three district championships and the, the state championship. And, of course, uh, Coach Rutenbar had completely built that program from the ground level, uh, starting the program. And I believe he had seven was it seven he had state seven, seven, yes. Before I mean, that, so yeah. even though you were part of the Bartow program, big shoes to fill, you win a state championship. So when you win that state championship, does it feel like, okay, I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I, I'm worthy of the Bartow brand. I don't know if it's so much, it's a, be, a big deep breath of, of relief because it's, I didn't run the program into the ground. I kind of kept the dynasty <laughs> alive. <laughs> so it was like an actual sigh of relief, like, okay. And then, you know, after that, it's like, well, maybe I do kind of know what I'm doing, so, you know, kind of continue the career. So, yes. Still a lot to learn, but... So, I'm sure you've thought about this already. How are you going to attack from going working with high schoolers to working with college kids? I know it's a different dynamic. I think, I mean, you still go with the same, you know, the same coaching style. I mean, um, it's just, you know, maybe it's their fifth senior year. Um, out there with a lot of freshmen and sophomores, so they're still kind of fresh, but... Um, I think it's still the same, the same game mentality, the same plan. I might have to be a little bit more strict, a little bit more disciplined, because they have a lot more freedom in their life. But I think the same game plan. Um, I'll have to just see how it goes, and if I have to adjust accordingly, then I will do so. Of course, won a state title as a player in 1997 at Bartow High School, and then as a coach in 2016. You've been around this area for a long time. You know the quality of players in Polk County. Uh, obviously a hotbed of talent when it comes to softball, the programs who have won state titles, you know, the Lake Wales and the Auburn Dales, mm -hmm. and I could go on and on and on. How are you going to use that to your advantage uh, when it comes to recruiting and, and maybe keeping some of that talent a little closer to home? Well, I think in the three years, um, I mean, of course I come out of Polk County and Bartow, so um, I have that going for me, I think. Um, but during my course of coaching at Bartow, I've, you know, formed some friendships with the other coaches around the county, with like Lake Wells, of course, um, Armandale, and the other ones. So I think 
by forming those like friendships, you know, coaching friendships, it'll kind of help feed, hopefully, I know definitely Coach Rootmar has already said, you know, you might not even have to recruit, I'll just send you all the good players, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's gonna be a huge advantage, a huge upside, so hopefully I won't have to go too far outside of Polk County to get what I need. I think it's probably interesting, and Devin, I'm, I don't want to feel like I'm dominating this conversation, but being <laughs> no. a Barto guy, I mean, <laughs> we, we all know that. Uh, go back, and, 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 and really what I'm looking for is to find how you're going to use that at Polk State, but, you know, replacing a legend at Barto like you did with Coach Rutenbar, and now the interesting situation of you take this opportunity to go be the head co uh, softball coach at Polk State College, he comes back. He's, he's replacing you now at Bartow High School. So talk about the dynamic and how that whole situation maybe is preparing you for something at Polk State. I definitely believe each, because I started out on eight and under coaching, assisting, um, and I, I went eight to tens to twelves, and then I got into the JV. So each step has been a stepping stone, I think, to lead me to where I'm at now and has kind of prepared me. Um, you talked about Coach Reed Martin kind of giving back the program to him. I mean, just even going over the basics of, hey, coach, there's such and such, like this amount in the booster account, you know, this is what's, the field looks a mess right now, just giving everything back. It was a weird conversation, but, you know, an exciting one because that's where he belongs, I believe. So, um, I don't know. I, I really can't really touch base because I don't know how coaching Polk yet, because I really haven't started, right. is really going to help me. I, maybe I can answer that better for you next year after I've one year under my belt, but... I think what I, my knowledge of the game from a player and to a coaching standpoint, I think has prepared me to hopefully lead Polk into a, a successful program. Okay. As you know, playing at, um, says Daytona State and UNF, mm -hmm. you know how it goes to basically from Polk State, you can have girls that move on somewhere else. Are you ready to help them out? Excited to see where they can go and? Um, I know for me, when I went to Daytona, you know, you can, well, number one, didn't have the grades to go to a four-year school. I mean, I had the grades, but it was difficult to pass like the SAT and the ACT. So maybe some of those kids I can help out to get them to where they want to go. So that'll be definitely um, a good stepping stone for them. Um, <clears throat> um, it's always helpful to have somebody that knows the position that you're coming from. So you could also be coaching girls that have the same SAT right, got same. caught up, in the, but they're still getting an opportunity to play. Yes. So you'll have that bond to help them out and be able to help them get to somewhere like UNF and mm -hmm. play at a bigger level, which will be, I think it'll be good for them to have that connection. I think so too. And then some people, you know, in the first two years, they want to stay close to home. And then once they get out on their own, you know, more of an adult, they can, they're ready and prepared better than what they would be going, you know, leaving their home with their mom and dad or whatnot and then going you know, four or five hours away is a little bit more difficult than what I think some of them realize. Mm -hmm. Having a lot mm -hmm. of success uh, during your time at Bartow, I think it says 63 and 24, we already talked about the districts and the one state championship. Do you see changing your style at all? Or are you gonna have the same style of Polk that you had at Bartow High School as far as your approach to the game and, and, and how you're going to uh, kind of manage during a game? I think it just, um, it'll have to stay aggressive. I mean, I'm going to have to see what I have. Um, this first year, I know I'm walking into 11 girls that I don't know who they are. And this Saturday, we're recruiting, trying to get seven for just this season. So it's going to have to be based off of what I have. And I mean, I've always said at high school, you're kind of given a deck and you have to figure out how you can play that hand. Um, so it's definitely going to stay aggressive. Um, uh, I'm a, I tend to be a small ball kind of person, mm -hmm. um, you know. You know, I'll let the girl that can say like Alexi Sims, you know, mm -hmm. in time of need, she, you know, nine times out of ten, she's going to, you know, hit a double to the fence. But, you know, sometimes teams aren't expecting her to bunt either. So it just kind of depends on the situation I'm in. But it'll definitely stay aggressive. So how many of those Bartow players have a fast track to Polk State because you already know what they can do? <laughs> Am I allowed to be honest about that? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just, I, don't know, I don't know if you can talk about that or not. But, uh, uh, well, when is there a fall season or when do things get going for you? Um, we're going to start about September 1. Um, we will definitely play some fall ball games. Um, I know I have 10 dates I can play, depending okay. on I can play tournaments or doubleheaders. We also are going to host um, two tournaments, the last two um, weekends of September. So we try to get a lot of travel ball teams in, you know, give me some people I can look at to hopefully, you know, better Polk State. So.
All right. Well, we certainly wish you good luck, and uh, we know you'll be very successful there. Uh, you were brought up in a successful program. You obviously showed that you can be a success in a program, and uh, uh, you know we're truly blessed to have as many great athletic uh, programs in the college level as we have in Polk County. And of course, Polk yeah. State's one of those. So good luck to you. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Well, recently I was able to uh, catch up with Nick Anderson, uh, of course, the uh, Orlando Magic great. Uh, he was at the Timeout Tuesday in downtown Auburndale uh, promoting the Lakeland Magic. Because remember, the Lakeland Magic, the developmental league team that's going to be at the RP Funding Center, will play their games in Lakeland. But at the, the new field house in Winter Haven is where they'll do the training and all the rehab and things like that. So the Lakeland Magic, we're in Auburndale promoting the brand. I got a chance to, meet, uh, to uh, talk to Nick Anderson. We'll take a look at that. We'll be right back here on Sports Central. Neil Duncan here for Sports Central. We have a great guest with us, uh, Nick Anderson from the Orlando Magic, downtown Auburndale, uh, representing not only the Magic, but the Lakeland Magic coming to Polk County. Welcome to Polk County, Nick. Oh, well, thank you. It's been a while since I, I've been here. Many, many years ago when I got drafted, I had the opportunity to come out here uh, and uh, mingle and meet some people back then. That was way back then. But uh, I must say this, we're in the home of, uh, of Tracy McGrady. You know, that's a lot to say. That's right, that's right. <laughs> we'll talk about, let's go back. Let's, in 1989, when you were the first pick of a new franchise, the Orlando Magic, what was that like to be that first pick? Uh, number 11, right? Uh, number 11, I was 11th pick. Uh, you know, I remember those days being drafted. Uh, you know, my friends back at home in Chicago was like, the Magic, that's not an NBA team. You know, like, y yes, it is. It's a, a expansion team. But it was a great opportunity for myself. Uh, couldn't have wanted it scripted any any other way. We talk about the Magic, family-friendly, Central Florida, now the Lakeland Magic coming to Polk County. Talk about what that means, the developmental league, excuse me, the G League now, G -League. what that means and what that's going to mean for the Magic brand. Well, uh, it's an opportunity for young men uh, to to develop themselves to get to that next level, and it's also, you know, uh, for 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 the guys, uh, the Magic team to come down, you know, coming off injuries, that kind of thing, just stay in shape and and, and, and get game preparation. But you know, for the city of uh, uh, Lakeland, I think it's it's great. Uh, you get to see. Uh, professional basketball uh, some of your your homegrown guys if they're here uh, talent that from around the country so I think it's a great opportunity for people to get on board to come out and watch some good basketball I'll certainly be here a whole lot yeah and you talk about the city of Lakeland of course the home games at the RP funding center uh, but the training facility will be in Winter Haven on the east side of the county the new field house got to be excited about a brand new facility for the guys well anytime you know uh, you get some some new things like that uh, all the updated modern area uh, equipment uh, the best, I would say, uh, top-notch equipment and keep yourself in, in good shape, uh, keep yourself uh, going. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I know the, uh, the uh, organization is, uh, people of Lakeland. So uh, again, I say come on and get your tickets, get on board and come watch some good basketball. Well, I want to say congratulations to you. I know you were re recently inducted to the University of Illinois Hall of Fame. What was that experience like? Well. Uh, being in the class, uh, uh, the guys that uh, that were inducted uh, along with myself, uh, I mentioned Dick Buckus. What a great gentleman! Uh, watched him from afar on film. Uh, Mr. Jerry Colangelo, who's uh, uh, the chairman of USA Basketball. Manny Jackson, who uh, who owned the uh, Harlem Globe Trotters, and many, many more. So it was a it was a great opportunity. Uh, and I'm very, very appreciative of it. Uh, and standing by those guys who, some, who etched their name in the stone, so to speak. So great opportunity. Well, the train is rolling through, so I guess that's a wrap. Thank you so much for coming down. All right, thanks for Thank having you. me. Thank back, you. Back to you guys. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Sports Central, where we will not have a train going by. Uh, that was 
funny part at the end of the interview there uh, with Nick Anderson, the train in downtown Auburndale went by, so we joked and said, well, I guess the interview's over, but uh, this second segment is going to be brought to us by the Hampton Inn Lakeside Village, a great partner of tourism and sports marketing, Neil Duncan alongside Devin Cook, and uh, I know our next co uh, couple of conversations are right in your wheelhouse, being someone who played uh, uh, football. Uh, of course, at Weber. It's gonna be a little, yeah. So, it's gonna be a little off. It's, it's, it's but I go to southeastern now. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah you're I'm a southeastern now. I'm torn. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but our second segment here, we want to uh, welcome uh, head coach Keith uh, Bearfield from Southeastern University. Uh, coach, welcome back to Sports Central. We certainly appreciate the time you stopping by and and talking to us about the upcoming season. Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. So, uh, conference championship last year. Well, it was uh, you know our first outright championship. Yeah. We we kind of right. we kind of uh, won it left-handed uh, a year ago. So we have two conference championships. They we we lost a regular season conference game a year ago and had that forfeited back to us. Made us undefeated in the conference, and so we get the banner. But uh, we legitimately won it on the field this past year. So. So we're more than happy to say that you know we have two conference championships in our first three seasons. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you corrected that because I knew that it was outright. I just didn't say <laughs> that, but uh, certainly uh, the second championship and you know as young as the program is, I keep saying that, but actually you're what uh, five six years in now. Well, this will be our fourth season that we've actually okay. competed on the field. But we, there was we, a, a year prior. We, to we that, had right? in 2013 we had our first recruiting class come in. We brought in a hundred and. Uh, 14 uh, freshmen and some transfers and we had uh, practice for a year so we were very much looking forward to September of 2014 <laughs> so we could uh, stop practicing. It's funny I know uh, Devin you can uh, talk to this much more so than I can because I remember the high school level but even the college and pros they get you get tired of hitting on each other so I can't imagine that's what two or three weeks I can't imagine going a whole year only hitting on each other. Well, I think we had a pretty good plan, uh, and I know our guys did get tired of uh, competing against each other every day. Uh, you know, we got tired of coaching against each other every day. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was one of those things where I, I did not have very much to, to do to get them motivated for the first game in the first season. So uh, it was good. We had, a, we had a great year in 2014 and then followed up with another good year in 2015 and then 2016 and and overall we're 25 and 7 in our first three years of, of competition so we've, we, we've enjoyed it so far but we have a, a big new challenge coming up this coming year. I remember that 2014 game I mean it was week eight but it was the intensity was high I mean eight games in y'all are still playing with revenge from having to play each other I mean I got beat up I felt it <laughs> I'll be honest <laughs> it was a great game but uh <laughs> Yeah, you, you were at Weber, and uh, you can certainly attest to the quality of football. Uh, and, and now the, the conference has changed a little bit. Uh, the Sun Conference has uh, gone into being partners now with the uh, Mid-South Conference. And then you've got a division within that, the Sun Division, and a lot of familiar faces from, from the Sun Conference there. But to talk about the change and what that means for not only Southeastern, but Warner and Weber and, and everybody in this area. Well, I think for all of us, it gives us a, a, a lot more exposure. Uh, we're now associated with actually the largest football playing conference in the country at, at any level. There are 20 teams wow. in the Mid-South this year. There are three divisions. There's the Bluegrass, there's the Appalachian, and there's a the Sun Division. And uh, the other two divisions have seven teams. We only have six teams this year. Uh, the only difference from the old Sun Conference is that Point University uh, has moved from the Sun to the Appalachian Division of the Mid-South. Faulkner uh, has moved, uh, I believe they were in the uh, Bluegrass Division and they've moved to the uh, Sun Division. So uh, that's, a, that's a different, basically, divisional foe and, and much like a conference foe. Uh, for everybody in the Sun Conference. For us, we play Faulkner every year mm -hmm. uh, for our first first three years and had some some very good games and they're an outstanding program. So that's made our overall division stronger. Uh, a year from now, we'll add Kaiser University who is adding football. Uh, they're doing the practice thing this year. They'll be uh, competing in 2018. So there'll be 21 teams in the Mid-South Conference. So we're, we're very excited about it. We think that uh, you know, we have if we can, uh, you know, have an outstanding season, uh, win our division. You know, we'll have a, a great chance at making the playoffs because of the strength of the overall schedule that we'll have, 
And one of the things I know all the, all the schools in the, in the Sun Conference are excited about is we basically have a set schedule at least for, for 10 games. And uh, we don't have to uh, look for games all over the country because when you have a 16 conference, you only have five games that are assured. There's, there's five or six games that you're looking for to play. And, and there's not really that many. Well, there are no more teams in Florida <laughs> for us to play right. at our level. So we have to look outside of the state. And last year, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the first time qualifying for the NAIA playoffs, correct? Yes, absolutely. That was, uh, uh, we finished the season ranked 18th. Uh, the criteria in NAIA is to, uh, to be ranked in the top 20. And if you win your, your conference, then you get an automatic bid. Uh, and so it's the same way for us this year. Uh, if we win our division, we're ranked in the top 20, we'll get an automatic bid to the playoffs. So, so Easily, our conference could have three teams in the playoffs, possibly four, and, and uh, I think it might be a little bit of a stretch, but it's not impossible to have, have five. Now, how does the conference championship work for all three divisions? Is there a game? Is there just outright winner? Well, there is no Mid-South Conference champion. It's, uh, it's, it's basically the three divisions, three divisional champions, because that's to have a, to get an automatic qualifier, you have to be uh, in a conference that has six teams, so a minimum of six teams. So we have three divisions that have seven in one and, and six in the other. So we get three automatic bids if we're ranked in the top 20 and and win our division. But there is no game to where where it is uh, like in the SEC. There's no Mid South Championship game. It's it's just uh, the divisional champions. Now, do you, do you feel like this team coming off last year, the outright championship, making the NAIA, NAIA playoffs for the first time, preseason poll just came out uh, showing uh, that everybody thinks that uh, you guys are going to be first in your division. Do you feel the target on the back? or uh, uh, I feel like I know what your response is going to be. Most coaches don't care about preseason polls. <laughs> they care about the next practice or the first game. Uh, but... I think it's a credit to the program and that record you talked about that people are starting to realize this program is for real and not going away. Well, you know, I'll put it this way, you know, what coach wouldn't want to be in this in this position? We right. we, we like this position much better than 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 being than being the hunter. Right. Although, you know, when you are the underdog and you are the hunter, that's a lot of motivation, you know, on your kids. But uh, you know, I I've, I've been in both spots and uh uh, we're we're very privileged and we're very happy that we're here. We also know that uh, this year uh, is only based, as far as our ranking is concerned, on what we did last year. And last year doesn't count in 2017. Right. It's 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 all about what we do now, and it's all flattering, and it's all good, and it's all motivational. Uh, but until we start playing games against each other, you know, we really don't know who's good and, and, and who's not, who's going to be the team to beat and who's not going to be the team to beat. But uh, we, we, know, we know this is that, uh, you know, when we go out there on Saturday afternoon and, and we play, we're going to be competitive and we'll let the chips fall where they may. But it's going to be a much, much more competitive situation this year for, for all of us that were in the Sun Conference going into uh, to the situation that uh, we'll be in this year in, in the Mid-South. Well, just like in uh, game plan, you can have a plan for something, but uh, as you get into the game, you, you kind of get thrown for a loop. If you don't mind, we're going to go ahead and throw it to a break and come back and talk more to you uh, if, you don't, if you don't mind doing that with us. As long as we're talking football. We're going to be yeah, talking right. football. So <laughs> we're going to go ahead and go to break, and uh, we're going to check out Jessica Roberts and Ryan Ritchie as they try their hand at uh, hand gliding uh, with Absolute Aqua Sports. So check that out, Devin, Neil, and Coach. Be right back here on Sports Central. It's Jess and Ryan here, and we are in Winter Haven, Florida, about a mile away from Legoland, and we're with Absolute Aqua Sports, and today, we're gonna fly. Fly? Fly, didn't I tell you? You didn't tell me anything. Oh, you're gonna fly board today. I've never done it before. That's okay. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna hang glide. Oh, 
this should be fun. I'll tell you what, uh, let's go have some fun. We will. I started in water ski shows and I didn't want to grow up and get a real job so I figured what better than getting a real job is start your own business and teach water skiing and flyboarding and hang gliding and all the things I love to do and I moved down here to Central Florida in Polk County about six years ago so we've been doing this down here for about five years. I was lucky enough to get hired at Cypress Gardens in 1977, and I worked there 29 years, and I've got, I don't know, maybe 20, 25,000 kite flights. I get people that have seen it forever and say, hey, I want to do that or I want to try that. I get families that are giving people Christmas presents and things like that, and uh, uh, all sorts of people in between. So, but you get the real enthusiast, like uh, he's seeking uh, a little bit of daredevilish stuff, and and they want to come fly and, and see what it's like. We, we take our time, we inspect the kite, always inspect, uh, make sure it's inspected correctly. And then uh, it takes a few minutes to put the harness on, get the person that I'm gonna give a ride to, uh, instructions on what's gonna happen. Uh, when we say the word release out of the boat, we're gonna be going up. It's pretty quick, uh, be ready for that. Um, we're going to release the rope when we're up, up at the top and we're going to fl fly down on our own and that's the fun part. And then hopefully we're going to land uh, uh, generally tandem. I land on the float sliding. Uh, if I was by myself, I land on my feet, uh, either on land or in the water. We offer a wide array of things. Um, obviously we offer water ski lessons, we offer flyboard lessons, we offer tandem hang gliding and we do uh, service all your marine repair needs for here on the Chain of Lakes in Florida. Um, your typical lesson is gonna last about an hour. Um, depending upon the site we meet you at, we'll get you there, we'll go through some of the ground schooling things like we did today with the guys, and it'll be talking about how the flyboard works, what we're gonna do, the signals I'm gonna give you, and then we put you in the board and get you out on the water. It is a trial by error system. Um, I can tell you and I can explain it to you all day long, but until you feel what's going on, you're not going to grasp how to, how to do it. But everybody takes to it really quickly. I had so much fun. I know, me too. We got to fly. You were so high up there, I couldn't believe how high you got. I know, that was a little, that was intimidating, but it was, I could see to Bartow and I could see to Auburndale and Mark pointed everything out. We saw Bach Tower Gardens. When I looked down, I could see my feet. That's it. Oh, so. but you were flying too. Well, we had a good time and I can't wait for our next adventure. I know, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> so for more information about Absolute Aqua Sports, go to absoluteaquasports.com or you can also visit our website visit centralflorida.org. Welcome back everybody to Sports Central to our uh, third segment, which is going to be brought to us by Office Furniture Depot. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation with uh, the head football coach at Southeastern University, Keith Bearfield. But uh, before I do, uh, Neil Duncan alongside... Uh, Devin, Coach. Coach. How's everybody doing? Well, I was going to be, I was nice going to be, I was going to be cute and work Weber in there somehow, but I just I froze. <laughs> but anyways, oh, Devin Cook. But uh, did you see Richie? Yeah. Brian Richie there? Yeah. He does a lot better at that than he did on uh, paddle boarding. I've heard he a lot stay about up that. On that. I see. I've heard a lot about both. That's the first time seeing one of them. So now I need to go check out the paddle boarding. All right. Well, you so. definitely want to check that out. Just another one of those great things that you can do here uh, in Polk County. And again, this third segment brought to us by Office Furniture Depot. And Coach, thanks for staying on. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, as you can tell, uh, of course, he played college football. And I love college football, so uh, we wanted to keep you for a little bit longer. Um, getting ready for the 2017 campaign. Uh, talk about the facilities there at Southeastern and, and how that gives you a competitive advantage because those facilities that they've given you are, are really second to none. Well, at, at the NAI level, uh, you know, we've been blessed to, to have that type of facility. We, we play, uh, you know, Victory Field, and, and that, uh, you know, is, a, is, a, is really 
for NEI would be considered state of the art. And uh, we, uh, uh, it's just been a real blessing for us, uh, not only to be able to play on it, but be able to practice on it every day. And, and you know how it is in Polk County, there's, there's a lot of water that comes down from the sky. And uh, <laughs> if, it were, if it wasn't for, for that field, we'd have a hard time getting our practices in. Uh, and, and of course, at this time of year, we do a lot of practicing in the morning because we don't want to battle the, uh, the electrical storms in the, in the afternoons. But, but uh, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've, really, we've really been uh, fortunate to, to have uh, that facility, the administration, uh, you know, bless us with that. The one thing I'll say about Southeastern's administration, they, they went out of their way to take care of our students and athletes first. And, uh, you know, didn't wait to bring them in and then try to get the money to, to build a stadium. Their vision and their goal was to have that stadium built before our very first home football game, and, and they succeeded in doing that. And, and that's something that I think that has set Southeastern apart because the kids come in and, and they know, you know, when, when we say something and when we, when we set a goal, we mean to reach it, and, and we do. And, but before the stadium was there, the thing that uh, – that sold our kids on Southeastern was, was just the, the campus itself that already existed. And uh, I like to say it, it, looks like a, it looks like a resort, but it's, it's not. It's, it's a university, <laughs> it's a college. Right. And, uh, but the kids, the kids would, would come in and, and they were just captivated by, uh, by what they already saw there. And so it was not hard for them to translate what our vision was for the football field and, and, and the overall situation with our, with our football complex. And, and uh, they bought into it, and and this year is the the first year that we have four-year seniors on the team, mm -hmm. and we have 11 of those seniors that were guys that came in in 2013, and all they did was practice for a year, and there was nothing on campus. There was, there was no stadium, there was no practice field, there was no weight room, there was no locker room, and to do any practicing, we had to go to Bonnie Park, which is now called Fletcher Park, right across the. Mm -hmm. The road from Lakeland High School, we had to practice there for for uh, two weeks with homemade equipment, and uh, it was very special time. <laughs> <laughs> by by a very special time, was it? Uh, do you mean to say you were thinking, "What have I done"? <laughs> well, no, I wasn't thinking, "What have I done"? They might have been thinking, "What do we get ourselves into?" Because uh, you know, we uh, everything we had tractor trailer tires, we had uh, sandbags. Uh, we had kegs filled with, with water and we had all kinds of different, uh, uh, you know, workouts that we would put our guys through just to, to, to get them in the right frame of mind because, like I said, we had no, we had no weight room over at Southeastern to, to speak of. There was a fitness room, but right. it had no weights that would accommodate a uh, 114-man uh, football roster. And, but the great thing was is that uh, uh, Crystal Lake Middle School, they allowed us to use their uh, football field that they have there on campus still from the old middle school days. Then we uh, got our weights in and we developed our weight room, developed our offices, and uh, our guys were able to get to work in October and, and we started functioning like a, like a real football team. Mm -hmm. And then they could see the progress with the stadium being built. So it was a very exciting time and, and, it's, and it's still an exciting time because if anybody has never been to Southeastern and seen a football game on a Saturday night, uh, you know, we try to do our part by putting on a on a good show, but also, you know, the uh, the people that uh, are in charge of, of running the game, they they put on an outstanding show with the jumbotron with the fire coming out. As a matter of fact, the day that I was brought into uh, uh, to one of our vice president's office to kind of uh, sign off on what the field was supposed to look like. All they could talk about were the things that they were going to do when the team came on the field and when we scored and this and that and whatever. So I went back to our office and I told our coach, I said, guys, don't care about what the record we have, but we better score some, better points, score some points because they want to shoot off their fireworks. <laughs> and if they don't get to shoot off their fireworks, we'll probably get our pink slip. <laughs> That's what caught me off guard. My first time over there watching a the spring game, I was sitting there watching touchdown. My face got real hot. Had no clue what was going on. Look up and the whole scoreboard shooting flames out of it. And so it is a great facility, a lot of things going on. Anybody that's never been out there, I definitely recommend it. And there's a Chick-fil-A on campus. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Not only a Chick-fil-A, but a Papa John's, a Backyard Burgers, and an Einstein that's a, yeah, Bagels. They have it all. Well, uh, first game, August 26th, you're going to be up in Kentucky against Union College, and uh, then you're home against uh, Bethel University, is that correct, on uh, September 2nd. 
so the home opener, but then you turn right around and go back to Kentucky. Well, we play three games in Kentucky uh, out of our first five games, and so when we start our season on, on August 26th, that will be our first of three road trips within a month that we'll make. As a matter of fact, in 28 days, we'll be in Kentucky uh, three times. Coach, and, are you originally from Kentucky? Well, are you no, going home no, and it's visiting? Not, it's, it's, it's not my old Kentucky home, but it's going to be my new Kentucky <laughs> home uh, for, for about a month. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we just hope our, our fans don't forget about us right. and uh, remember that they have a football team. And we hope some of them come up and join us because I think it's going to be a great time. And it's going to be a big challenge because there's some great teams up there to play. And I also see something else that's interesting. I don't know if you were going to comment on that, but uh, both Warner and Weber at home. Well, you know, that's that's good for this year, but it's not so good for well, the next say, year. <laughs> we're not the, you're a coach. We're not talking about next year yet. We're talking about this year. Uh, well, so uh, you get both of those uh, in-county rivals at home. Got to like that. Well, that's it's always good to, to play them on, on your home field. Uh, you know, but they come ready to play no matter no matter where you play. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's it's those games are developing into an outstanding rivalry. You know, with all, we're all within about 25 miles of each other. And, uh, you know, the kids know each other and, and played against each other in high school. And, and uh, so it's, it's, a very, it's a very unique time and a very special time. And, and uh, you know, we're all right now in the same, same conference, and it's, it's going to be, a, it's gonna be a, great, a great time for this year and, you know, as the years go by. One thing we were talking about off air was um, coming from Weber, we always had a strong running game. Um, and with you guys, you have Drell Reynolds, like you're talking about the 11 seniors that are now ready to play their senior year um, for the first year of seniors. What else outside of him, a great player, do you have coming in this year we should keep an eye out for? Well, you know, uh, first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a little bit about Jarrell Reynolds because he, he has been, you know, the mainstay of our offense. He's rushed for over 3,600 yards in three years, and, you know, we think he's on track to, to have another great year. And, and uh, he's, he's one young man I'm very happy to have had joined our program because he's made me look like a good coach for three years. <laughs> and I and anticipate him doing the same thing this year. So I won't look ahead either, but, but you know, you might see, find out what kind of a coach I am after Jarrell graduates <laughs> because he's done an, out, an, outstanding, an outstanding job. But, you know, we've, we've got some other seniors. You know, at, at, tie, at tight end, we've got Matthew Craig, and this is his fourth year. He started for four years for us, started, at, started every game. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a great blocker and a, and a great uh, uh, pass-catching threat. On defense, we've got Will Tillo. He's a, he's a senior. He has taken almost every snap at linebacker for us, has been our leading tackler, and has been a, a captain for, for four years. From his, from his freshman year, he was voted team captain all, all the way through. Uh, and then, you know, we've got, uh, uh, we've got other guys like Colin Thomas, who's, who's another captain and that plays uh, strong safety. And one of the things I like to mention about Colin is not only has he been a starter for four years and he's a captain, but uh, he graduated this spring with a 4.0, the first Southeastern student in the history of the business department to graduate with a perfect 4.0 in international business. Wow. And so he's now going to be working on his master's and also uh, he's going to be a graduate assistant in the spiritual formation. Uh, area of the, of the university. So, you know, he's, he's kind of what we talk about and kind of what we try to preach there at Southeastern. We're looking for young men who are champions, you know, not only on the field, not only in the classroom, but also for Christ. And that's, that's kind, of, kind of the example that, that we try to have. But all of these young men, the, the 11 seniors that were what we call our Bonnie Park boys, plus, you know, I've got, uh, I've got a few more, about seven others that are are four-year seniors that came in 2014 uh, that uh, are itching to play their, their senior year and, and kind of go out on a, on a good note. You talk about the, I think you said the Bonnie Park boys, is that how you said that? Uh, how, how is that going to be as you get through the, through the year? Because obviously there's, there's a, a different connection to them than your second class or your third class or because you, you know, you started this at the ground level and practicing for a year and have you have you started to reflect on that or that's that's after the season that's that's later but they really have been the trailblazers of what is southeastern football well you know uh you know when 
I'm by myself, and you know, there's time to reflect, and I think about those guys. You know, I, you know, I, I know I'm going to miss them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I don't know what's going to be like going out to practice every day and and not, not be joking around and kidding and, and doing things with you know with those guys. So, you know, I tell people sometimes as a coach, you get to graduation time, and you see people graduate, and you're happy because they didn't make a you know a big difference in, mm-hmm. in what you were doing. But every one of these seniors. They are players, and they are performers, and they are leaders, and they have been vital. Our program would not have been close to what it is today without the leadership and the work and, and the commitment that these young men have, have, uh, have shown these past four years. And we're just excited for them. The one thing is we know that they're going to be successful once they graduate because every one of them are young men of character. And I think the... the you talk about the the character and, and how Southeastern wants to to do things, and not only your um, uh, your sports, but also the the academics, and uh, you know, and your your athletic director. Uh, he's been fantastic, uh, not only there but in the com- uh, in the uh, community the side, community side yeah. and and just <laughs> looks like you guys just have your hands in every bit. I know you've been caught, you know, caught, uh, or been, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought here, but you've been in uh, co- uh, football for a long time. What is out, uh, Southeastern like with the others? like? Well, you know, this has definitely been the most fun time that I've ever had. You know, I mean, you know, I took this job when I was, well, the day that I was announced as the head football coach, I turned 57. So, so really, my career as a coach, I won't say was over, but you know, there's a lot that was in the books and I didn't have to worry about what mm-hmm. my legacy was. And uh, coming into this one, you know, I'd always told people never to start a football pro, never be the first coach in because <laughs> it's a losing proposition. And I had players calling me, coach, what are you doing? You told us never to do that. I said, well, this is one thing that I've never done. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I've always, in my years of recruiting, driving up and down I-4, and knowing about Southeastern, I had two older brothers that graduated from Southeastern. I always said if Southeastern ever started a football program, I wanted to be the first in line to be the head coach. And so when I heard that it happened, you know, things worked out. And it's been, it's been very exciting because, because everybody on campus, I mean, have almost to a T, have, they've been excited about starting football and what football could, could mean and bring to the campus and, and change the cat, campus atmosphere. And of course, you know, there are also some that were concerned about it. And so I think for, for me, having a, having a background and understanding what Southeastern was all about, I had pretty much the blueprint in my mind of what would be good and what would not be good for Southeastern and, and how Southeastern fits into this community. And uh, we worked real hard. That first year, we told our kids, hey, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna be able to win any football games, but this is what we can win. We can win over the student body. We can win over the faculty. We can win over the administration. We can win over our neighborhood. We can win over our community. And if we go out of our way to try to win those things and we build that foundation into our program, when we start competing, those other things will fall into place. And that's what we tried to do. Well, it's been uh, unbelievable, and uh, we got a couple more minutes left to go. But uh, I want to look at the uh, congratulations to you and the into- uh, entire Southeastern University um, uh, family. Uh, but looking at the the schedule coming up, who's that one team? All of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> the only team I'm concerned about is the one we play the next game. Yep. And. That's, we're, we're focusing on Union College. And when Union College, we face them, we square off with them. If we can go undefeated that week, mm-hmm. then we take on the next one. But each one has equal importance. Each team represents one-tenth of our schedule. And we're, we're, out to, we're out to win. And I don't let my players focus on anything else. Any, any, any time we do any conditioning, the things that comes out of my player's mouth is beat whoever we're playing that week. And that's what we're focused on. I always love asking that question. Coaches are tough. You know the answer. <laughs> I mean, are tough. It's always fun to see the coach 
say it in a different way to get to the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's the next yeah. one up. <laughs> well, Coach, we certainly uh, appreciate it. We uh, appreciate you staying on for a second uh, segment here on Sports Central, but we know that uh, you're always going to be able to uh, give us so much insight into not only Southeastern, but college football uh, in general. So good luck this year. Uh, we wish you nothing but the su success that uh, we know that's coming. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to you guys coming out watching some of our games and all the viewers out there. Again, if you haven't had a chance to come out and, and watch the fire play, it is a show on Saturday night. Well, real quick, let the viewers know where exactly Southeastern is in case they don't know and where the football stadium is. Okay, well, the football stadium is on the corner of 1000 Longfellow Boulevard and North Crystal Lake Boulevard, right, right, off, of, right off of 98. And uh, when you get in that area, you'll be able to, to, see, to see the lights. And I guarantee you, if you come homecoming, you'll see a fireworks display that rivals anything you'd see up Interstate 4. I guarantee you. All right. And well, so far, we've been able to enjoy every one of those fireworks displays. You know who yeah, they play well, on homecoming? Huh? You know who they play on homecoming? Who's that? Whatever. I'm almost, I'm almost positive. At we'll Pol see you there. Yeah. Yeah. Polk County <laughs> I'll, be sitting, I'll be sitting <laughs> in a corner somewhere. I don't know. I'll be careful. <laughs> All right, Coach. Thanks again. All right, well, we're ready for uh, some college football in Polk County, but before we get there, we're going to take a look at our athlete spotlight. That's going to be Dylan Williams, a wrestler from Ridge Community High School up in the Davenport area. Stick around. Devin and Neil will be right back here on Sports Central. Wrestling is just, I don't know, it's just the best thing out there. Um, I guess you could say that hard work, you need to put in a lot of hard work and commitment to be a good wrestler. Wrestling is a great sport. Uh, it really will test a kid's character and it will it'll bring out the best in people. Um, it's a chance, first off, if you got any kind of aggression you need to work out, it's a great opportunity to work that out. Um, it's a good conditioner. Uh, it requires a lot of toughness, physical toughness and mental toughness. And it's just, it's a great event because there's no blaming anybody else because it's you versus somebody else in front of everybody. So that's your chance to shine. And I think, I think it's, a, it's a great sport for kids to be a part of. Um, Coach pushes through a lot of difficult tasks for long periods of time just to make sure that we're conditioned right. And we can last as long as possible. My teammates and my coach, they just motivate me so I can keep going. Dylan, I met at football practice for JV. He didn't come out during the summer. Um, it was during uh, his freshman year playing JV football. Um, when they got done, I kind of had a little announcement and said, hey, anybody wants to try out for wrestling, you, know, you guys are done, we'll take you. And uh, Dylan showed up, and that's how I met Dylan for the first time. I, I've improved a lot, I could say, but I can do better. You just got to pay attention and practice, really. Once you see it, you can always repeat it. Practice makes perfect. Dylan has gotten a lot better in his technique. Dylan's a great athlete. He's probably one of the best athletes we've had on the team in terms of raw ability. Um, but his technique has always, it was a little rusty to start. Um, but he's just gotten better and better. He's a tough kid, um, just like David is. And he's another kid that um, I found that our team can lean on when we need a key win here or there to try to put a, the team in the best position to come out on top. Um, I could say that from wrestling, it's helped me. It's helped calm me down a little more because once school's over and I come in here, I can let off any steam that I want. It's kind of soothing once you get in here because you know you're surrounded by family, so you can really do anything you want. There's been times when like the conditioning's been pretty bad. I thought about not coming anymore, but then coach is always like, "Don't quit now. Keep going." And every time I keep going, it just gets easier every time. Dylan has mentioned that he uh, intends to enroll in the Army. I think he'd be a great, it'd be a great fit for him. Um, he's a very tough, uh, athletic uh, kid that likes 
physical activity and, uh, you know, he, he would thrive in the Army. I think making it to districts was a huge goal for me. It was, it was, it was great. I loved it. Plan on doing it again. Hey everybody, welcome back to Sports Central. Neil Duncan alongside Devin Cook and our fourth and final segment brought to us by Hollywood Signs, a great partner of tourism and sports marketing uh, located right here in Bartow. And uh, some great footage there of our uh, athlete spotlight, but uh, what can you say about Coach and uh, what he brings, Coach Burfield? It's, he's a good guy. And he can also tell you that I'm so excited college football is around the corner. I really didn't have much focus on small town college football, even though I played it. But um, you know, Florida State, Alabama coming up, big things. But after hearing him talk, there's going to be a lot going on in Polk County in football this year. Well, and here's the thing. Support the local teams because even if you have a state school that you, uh, that you follow, Florida State, Miami, Florida, you know, whomever, UCF, Florida, or US, USF, the technology that we have now, just record it. Turn off your notifications, go support the local college football teams, and then go home and watch the, the game that you, you know, the team you support. Yeah, or go out and, yeah, like you said, go out and watch them yourself. As he was saying, the facilities out there, Weber, Warner, they all have some great facilities, and it's for the uh, family, kids. Get out there and check them out. And that's with all our events, not just football, not just sports or softball. A lot of things to do around here that people miss out on. Absolutely. Well, real quick, we've only got a few minutes left to go, but uh, we got some events coming up. All right. So first, we have um, Freedom Sports Co-ed States. It's going to be Saturday, August twelfth, uh, Southwest Complex. That's going to be slow pitch draft style tournament. So we have some softball. More as Coach was talking about earlier. Of course, we always have table tennis. Always, always have table tennis. Great Florida event. Orange Blossom Table Tennis Series Summer Open 2017. Man. Definitely want to check yep. that out. Just go out there. Don't try and say the title. That's a lot. Just go hang out, have a good time. That's going to be Friday, August 18th, and Saturday, August 19th at Simpson Park Community Center. Coleman Junior Super Series, uh, Saturday, September 9th through Monday, September 11th. Of course, that's at the Beerman Family Tennis Complex. Great uh, tennis events going on out there uh, each and every year. And uh, it's all about that economic impact. I actually started playing tennis. Did you? Yeah, I've been going to Beerman. It's a nice place. Really? Yeah. I'm going to take don't, you on sometimes. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> don't, don't tear up the facility. No, are, are you pretty good? Eh, I, the serving's real difficult. It's going to be all right. I'm going to figure it out. There you go. Maybe I will go play it then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so next we have the US IPSC Pistol Nationals out there at Universal Shooting Academy, September 12th through September 17th. And as you know, that place is amazing. They've done a lot out there, um, upwards of 30 bays. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great uh, facility out there at Frostproof, and uh, we definitely uh, appreciate Frank Garcia and the whole crew with all the things that they do out there. And uh, looking for a big announcement coming from uh, Universal Shooting Academy, but we won't talk about it quite yet, but uh, there might be some big that's, news coming. That's news to me. Yeah, and we also have some uh, special thanks for some sponsors. So we want to thank Cypress Lanes, Winter Haven Harborside, Party Rentals, Unlimited, Post 09, and Regal Palm, some of the great partners from Tourism and Sports Marketing. Uh, we'd like to thank all of those sponsors. We'd also like to remind you, go to the radio version of Sports Central on 96.7 and Talk 1430 WLKF. Uh, you can also go to centralfloridasports.com for a full list of our events. And our phone number is 863-551-4750. Our next live show will be August 25th. Until then, we want to thank everybody that joined us today. Get ready for that college football for Devin Cook. I'm Neil Duncan. We will see you guys next time. I'm Pam Deneve. I'm a volunteer at Circle B Bar Reserve, and we are today at Crooked Lake West doing scrub jay surveys. Um, the scrub jays need to be surveyed on an annual basis to determine the population and the population dynamics if they have had a successful breeding. Uh, also for land management because they have to have open scrub type habitat for them to bury their acorns and to raise their young effectively and be free for 
predators and not, not have hiding places for predators. So we come out and survey them just to see what's happening within the bird population and to inform the land managers of anything that needs to be done. The Florida scrub jay is listed as a threatened species in Florida. It is only in Florida. It is an endemic bird to this area. It's our only endemic bird in Florida. And it likes to live in the scrub habitat, which of course is popular with developers. So that's why it's declining in population, that and land management issues. The Florida scrub jay uh, is a cooperative breeder. They um, will nest and last year's juveniles, uh, adults at this point, will help to raise this year's babies. So those are considered helper birds. And of those, there's usually one bird that will sit up on top of the closest tree. And be, that's called the sentry bird or the sentinel bird to watch for predators and to alert the other birds in case of a predator nearby. Um, so the hawks, the swallowtail kites, um, snakes, any other predators in the area that might take, they do sound an alarm. And um, then this year's babies will then become the helpers for next year. So the population kind of grows that way. And then the population from one area, hopefully you will migrate to another area. They don't go very far, like 10 to 25 miles is about max to breed with other birds so that hopefully you'll have a sustainable population. We survey Crooked Lake West, the Stewart property, the Lewis track, and I think that's pretty much it in Polk County for environmental lands. The whole Lake Wales Ridge in Florida is pretty much the, the habitat for the Florida scrub jay, but they also will live on each coast a little bit in little pockets. Jay Watch is a state program run through Audubon of Florida and they coordinate volunteers all over the state to come together at different sites everywhere they know that there are scrub jays to do surveys and they do it from June 15th to July 15th and it's all over from Ocala down to Highlands County so it's they coordinate a lot of people and land managers just to try to and tell them what they need to do to help the birds. One of the ways that we try to get the Florida scrub jay and, and other birds to come out is called pishing, and you just go pss, 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 pss. And that supposedly alerts the birds that there's somebody out there, we need to go investigate, we need to check it out, and then they'll, they will come up and look to see what's going on. So part of the protocol is you come out and you look for predators, and then if there are no predators present, then you will play a speaker with got a Florida scrub jay call on it. And you play that for a minute and then you wait two minutes to see if anybody responds. And then um, if they don't, then you repeat that process three times and at a transect point and it's a laid out set of points that um, the land manager has set. So you can compare habitat, you know, if it's good habitat for the scrub jays, if, if they're present and if you go to an area that's not uh, populated with jays then you can look to see what does the habitat look like maybe it needs to be burned or mechanically removed or something like that. I guess the overall consensus at the there's an annual event for the Jay Watch volunteers and they will do a compilation of all the sites how many sites where there actually are birds how many sites where there were birds and numbers of birds so it's kind of depressing and the birds are on the decline you know and so it's it gets to be a problem and there's just more and more land converted all the time from from scrub to developments. I think enough people care and are working to help save the Florida scrub jay that there's always hope. So if people want to volunteer to help with Jay Watch they can go on Audubon Florida's website or contact Tabitha Beal at Polk County Environmental Lands at Circle B Bar Reserve.
I did not feel like I was going that fast. We lost our set list. We had to go back to the house. It took forever to put on this face paint. I mean, look at the detail. There's no excuse. Obey the sign or pay the fine. I actually put the 55 on backwards because of the mirror. Yeah.